it only takes a moment. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the second Thursday of the month, which means it's time for Vegan Doc Talk with Dr. Scott Harrington. And today he's going to be talking about home testing, how you can take charge of your health care at home. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Scott Harrington. Thanks for coming. We get so many questions for you, like they're sent in. So I hope you got some snappy answers for us. All right. All right. Once again, thanks for having me on, Chef AJ. I love your show. Well, thank you. We love you coming on and taking your time to do this. It's such a great service. So home tests, I'm thinking are things like measuring blood pressure, maybe things like that. Yeah, you know, I got a lot of positive feedback about the time I came on and talked about lab tests. You know, I showed my labs and, you know, how do I interpret these things? And, uh, you know, a lot of people were saying, oh, I listened to this. And, and, and what about this test? What about that test? And it was great feedback. And I was thinking to myself, you know, there's so many tests that we have access to. You can just buy them on Amazon and we have smart watches and we have vital signs equipment. And after the pandemic, how everything kind of went back to the home, uh, I, we, a lot of us are becoming used to things like this, you know, like we have the COVID tests and we're, we're just used to doing telemedicine and having these, uh, uh, these capabilities at the house. So I thought I would highlight a few. Fantastic. Awesome. Awesome. So I guess we could get right into it. Yeah, get right into it. And uh, we will then do the questions that have been sent in, in when you're done. All right. All right. Good deal. Good deal. I guess, well, I'm going to share my screen and you kind of give me the feedback if it all works out. That's you. Okay. Okay. Well, yes, you know, my name is Dr. Scott Harrington. I'm a family doctor and I have a practice called Vegan Primary Care. Uh, my goal is to reach out to vegans and folks who are plant-based and vegan and, 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 and support them and be their doctor. I have licenses in many states and I can be your doctor and provide primary care through telemedicine. So uh, these are the states that I have license in, licenses in, and I can uh, treat you from, from here in Florida where I live. Uh, but even if you live in Oregon, I can be your doctor. So I do have insurance. Uh, I have uh, patients can see me if uh, for cash pay basis, and they also through insurance, Aetna, Cigna, Tricare, Medicare. Um, just a quick thing about my practice, you know, it's a lifestyle medicine focused practice, and I have this get to your goal weight loss meeting on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern, and it's a lot of fun. I usually have about 10 folks at a time, and we'll discuss what went right on our plant-based journey over the week, and uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. So meanwhile, what are we talking about today? We're talking about the home testing, take charge of your healthcare at home. Uh, uh, this woman is wearing a continuous glucose monitor on her arm, and her dog approves. I want you to know. Okay. So uh, I kind of gave a little introduction to this, but one of the ideas is the change from medical paternalism to the idea of a collaborative healthcare environment where uh, back in the day, the doctor had all the knowledge and it was siloed and you know the patient just kind of accepted and, and, and was a passive participant in uh, their healthcare. But nowadays we have the power of the internet and you can know pretty much everything there is to know about something if you go online and watch a few videos and you know read some articles, uh, you can become very smart about your, uh, your condition. Uh, and then we also have a lot of home tests and apps and lots of things going on. Uh, and so it's kind of changed where the doctor is almost like your coach in a way. Uh, coaching you through uh, and a little less of an authority figure and more of like a peer in, uh, in this uh, health journey. And so I wanted to focus on the self-monitoring tools. Um, so first and foremost, it's a good idea to have some home vital signs equipment. Most people have a scale and most people will have a thermometer, especially if they have kids. They're used to having a thermometer at home. But 
having a blood pressure cuff is really nice. It adds a lot. It almost brings a doctor's office into your home in a way. Uh, for So these are devices that you can have like the pulse ox, uh, pulse oximeter, uh, gets your heart rate and your blood oxygen level. And the, these, this just really amplifies the productivity of a telemedicine visit that you would have. Uh, what about specific conditions where you should have various tools? Um, many of them come to mind. I mean, you, almost anything you can think of, there's, there's tools out there. And uh, for instance, if you have diabetes, having a glucometer, we all know about that. Have, if blood pressure, a cough for blood, if you have hypertension, having a scale that you can monitor fluid shifts, if you're all of a sudden retaining water, your weight goes up. Um, nowadays, you know, with Apple and other watches, you can do heart rate monitoring with AFib, AFib screening. So this is amazing. That's amazing technology. It'll alert your doctor whether you have uh, atrial fibrillation. Um, for asthma, and you know, I didn't have time to kind of really dive deep into each one of these, but asthma is something called a peak flow meter, this device that can tell you your um, amount of restriction in the lungs and can give an objective number that you can tell your doctor. It's very cheap, it's a piece of plastic, $20. And so these, these are great things, asthma, having a pulse oximeter. Sleep, sleep is being monitored now with the watches, the whoop band, Fitbit, and, and, you know, if you have a fancy bed, you know, the bed can track it, the sleep number bed, all this stuff. Um, uh, fertility, everyone is used to having the idea of having home pregnancy tests, but in terms of fertility, the ovulation kits, you know, I, this wasn't really super popular, you know, uh, when I, when I was younger, but the idea of these Ovulation kits are super easy to get. You can tell when you're ovulating by looking for the luteinizing hormone. It's really amazing. Um, cycle app, apps that follow your cycle and ovulation, amazing. Nowadays, even fecal occult blood testing to screen for if you're having microscopic bleeding uh, in the stool. These are now home tests that you can get, or you can buy online. We're also, in terms of infectious disease, used to the COVID tests. We're going to talk about uh, urinary strips today, but also there's, uh, you'll see in the stores now, uh, bacterial vaginosis testing with pH, vaginal pH strips. Uh, and they, there's also even, you can get over-the-counter HIV testing. So very, very impressive. But this is a, there's a big world out there of all this, and it's expanding all the time. So uh, today we're, I'm going to go over continuous blood glucose monitors, blood pressure monitors, nitric oxide strips, and urinary test strips. So first things first, continuous glucose monitors. I really like these. I, I've used them myself and I don't have diabetes, but it's, it is a great tool for uh, getting an understanding of how uh, uh, your food affects you metabolically and your mood affects you metabolically and all, all this. It's really, really great. So who should do this? Well, folks who obviously have diabetes, this is a game changer. Continuous glucose monitors can link to, to pumps, uh, insulin pumps, and it becomes almost like an external pancreas, uh, amazing. But people who don't take uh, insulin and uh, can still benefit a lot from this, people who have metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, something called uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, people who are, who have gestational diabetes, they're pregnant and they're trying to keep their blood sugar low. Uh, and, and if you want to lose weight, you can see how the food you eat is affecting your blood sugar. You have to get a prescription for this. So, uh, you can't totally be without a doctor, although there are third party things online that, uh, that you can get, uh, get set up with this, although they make it a little bit more expensive for you. Uh, they tend to last for 10 to 14 days. And so for weight loss, let's say most people would be interested in this, just trying it out for weight loss. So how, how is it really, how's knowing your blood sugar really going to help you lose weight? Well, the fir first, first things first is, you know, most people who try to lose weight, you know, will usually hit a plateau at some point. And so then you're kind of looking for any little tweak that will help you kind of push through the barrier. 
So an example of this is getting awareness of your eating habits. When you know you're monitored the whole time, it, it makes you kind of really uh, aware. You know you're being watched in a way. And so it automatically makes you a little bit more aware. Um, and then the idea is finding out what works for you. Uh, you may really, you know, the who cares what the vegan royalty, the vegan doctor experts say, what works for me? You know, when I eat potatoes or when I eat oatmeal or when I eat some other carb, how, how uh, problematic is the spike in blood sugar? So it's nice that you can take charge of your health and you can say, well, for me, it, it works this way and, uh, and you can adjust your actions accordingly. Taking your favorite food and testing it, uh, seeing if it's problematic. Uh, we know that blood sugar is worse in the, e in the evening. So there's a circadian rhythm to this. So seeing how that affects and seeing how the benefit of eating earlier in the day, this was one of the biggest things uh, for me when I've learned is how many of us will say, oh, I must have low blood sugar. Oh, I, my mood, you know, I, my, I, my mood is down. My blood sugar must be low. Well, I found out for Dr. Harrington when <laughs> I thought this and I looked at my uh, blood sugar, it didn't seem to correlate at all with how my blood sugar was. My mood seemed to uh, be more related to what my expectation was about my mood or my exhaustion or fatigue or the night before, how, you know, did I get good sleep? And uh, the way I felt seemed to be more correlated with those things than my blood sugar. So that, that, is, that was a very uh, powerful thing for me. Another thing with this is the idea of these trend arrows. The blood sugar monitors can kind of tell the future. They can kind of tell you what's going to, where your trend is with your blood sugar and it helps you learn, uh-oh, maybe I should get out and exercise or walk after my meal. I can get my blood sugar down from, uh, from going on a huge spike. Last but not least, alerts. If you wear a continuous glucose monitor at night and you roll over on it and you block the blood flow to the meter, it's going to alert you, oh my gosh, your blood sugar is too low. And, and in this case, uh, it can be kind of annoying. So you, uh, you don't have blood, low blood sugar, you've just rolled over on your monitor. So, uh, so don't, don't worry. Okay, here's the idea of seeing where target range is. And what this slide shows is little dots where people are doing a, a point of care glucometer, you know, not a continuous glucometer, but just you know, an as needed glucometer test. And they could potentially miss uh, areas where the blood sugar was really high or really low. So this is the ben one of the benefits of a glucometer, uh, a continuous glucometer. So there's many blood sugar factors. And we talk about the glycemic index. So which carb type? Is it a whole food? Is it slow release? Is it going to release the carbs slowly? Um, is there fat in the meal? Is there fat going to, you know, perpetuate this blood sugar longer in my body? Um, the timing of the meals. One of the big factors is exercise. If you exercise once, it seems to make your blood sugar lower all day long. Do you imagine the muscles burning up the, the sugar? So all day long, they're going to be replenishing that uh, the blood sugar in the muscles and it is going to be continuing keeping your blood sugar lower all day. And the converse of that, let's say you travel or something like that, where you're very sedentary, sitting around, not using that um, neat energy uh, where you are uh, not just burning energy at baseline, then your blood sugar will go up a lot. Uh, and that, that's something that you'll find. Stress can affect it. Uh, and by using the, uh, the glucometers, you'll be able to see this. Um, if you get poor sleep the night before, or some folks have this dawn phenomenon where the blood sugar uh, can be really high in the morning. And it's good to know. Medications like steroids will definitely increase your blood sugar. And of course, diabetic medicines affect that. So these are the two glucometers that tend to be most common. Uh, is a Dexcom and Freestyle Libre. Uh, uh, right now they're on Dexcom 7 and Freestyle Libre 3, but still you might end up getting a, a 2 or a, Dex, a, D, a G6. Uh, they have become smaller and more effective. So here's the cost. Now, this sounds like a lot of money, and it would be a lot of money if you had to do it every month, but a splurging for one month or, or even half a month 
uh, is worthwhile because it's an experiment and you learn. Um, and so this is with a coupon for, you get three sensors or a month supply for of the G7 and uh, you get a coupon through something called GoodRx. You go online or go into your phone app, GoodRx. You pull up a coupon for your pharmacy. Um, what happened to me is I went, I had my GoodRx coupon and I went to my pharmacy. It was Walgreens. And Walgreens said, whoa, we have our own, we have our own coupon. Uh, we can get that even less. So that, that was nice. So you might find that it'd be even a little cheaper. Uh, for Freestyle Libra, it's two sensors because they last for 14 days. Last time I discussed hemoglobin A1C. This is a long-term blood sugar test. This is where the hemoglobin gets, has, it gets gly, glycated, glycated. It gets, it's sugared up uh, where the sugar will actually attach to the hemoglobin molecule. And it's almost like an aging process and uh, or a rusting in a way. And so the higher our blood sugar, the higher percentage of our hemoglobin A1C. And because it's related to the life of a blood cell, it gives us this long average. And so you can see here that if your hemoglobin A1C is 4.5, that is super low. That means that your average blood sugar is 82. I only have a few patients who have uh, uh, A1C of 4.5. Um, most of my patients have you know, 5.0, 5.2, 5.3, and, um, and I've kind of ranged in that area as well. Uh, so uh, prediabetes starts at 5.7, but if you are on the cusp, this might be something that you want to try to see if you can get your blood sugar down uh, just by the way you eat. Okay, few more concepts about this glucose. Glucose tolerance is worse at night. The graph on the left, is where they infused blood sugar, uh, infused sugar into the blood slowly through an IV. And then they watched how the overall blood sugar uh, was affected. And it, you know, over time, uh, as it went into the hours of darkness, it goes up. And so on the right side of the screen, there is uh, two meals eaten with the same calories and uh, the, basically a morning meal versus the blood sugar on an evening meal. And so you can see it goes higher and wider. And the area under the curve is kind of the damage that occurs. So you want to have, if you have a blood sugar spike, you want to see it come right back down, right back down. That's what you want to see. Okay, what's causing this? Well, we think one of the things that we think is causing this, well, the circadian rhythm has an effect, is the idea is that when you are asleep or at night, there's growth hormone. And growth hormone it play, it has many functions, but in terms of your blood sugar, growth hormone at night causes uh, breakdowns of fats and release of and production of blood sugars. And so if you've eaten late at night, you already have the, in, the, in this scenario, in this setting of having higher, uh, higher growth hormone. So that it might be one of the things. And so after dark, it's just herbal tea, herbal tea, zero cows. Here's Dr. Harrington's Freestyle Libre 2 monitor. And this is an average this is a kind of an average you can see. Even for me, I, you know, I, I tried to eat smaller meals at night, but um, I tried my best. But uh, you can see you get the morning spike, the lunch spike is a little bigger, and then there's my evening spike. Okay. What let's say we get a glucometer and we want to try some experiments. We want to, we want to do it. We want to see what we can do. So for the first two days, just kind of do your normal activities and see how your blood sugar goes. Uh, and then as you, you get on a little bit further and you can, you can know your baseline, try some things. Try this different um, glycemic indexes of foods. You know, try, try quick oats versus uh, rolled oats or oat groats. The oat, oat groats have a lower glycemic index. There's, uh, it's harder for the body to break it down and slower. Uh, you'll see a slower and lower spike on the, on the blood sugars. You can try eating your carbs, uh, complex carbohydrates with vinegar, and it will block the absorption of them and slow it down. A tea, just a teaspoon, just a teaspoon of vinegar. Uh, so in some, sort of like a balsamic uh, vinaigrette. You could try to increase the carb to fiber ratio. So you can see here, uh, a slice of white bread, 14 carbs to less than one carb of fiber, the ratio is 17.5. But if you consider some black beans, oh my God, they get, you know, blowing up with fiber, 40 carbs to 15 grams of fiber 
the ratio is 2.7, so super low. So you'll see that greens and beans, oh my gosh, you barely have any spike on your blood sugar. It's, it's amazing. So greens and beans for the win. Okay, there is a concept of trying to block the absorption in your gut by pre-eating with things like greens or um, salad or high fiber, high soluble fiber foods like apple, where you eat it like 30 or 40 minutes before the meal and some of it starts making its way into the small intestine and sort of creating almost like a biofilm, almost like a film over the um, intestinal lining uh, so that it decreases the absorption, slows the absorption. And so this is kind of a little, a little trick that folks are starting to learn now that we have these continuous glucometers. Timing of the meal, we talked about that. If you try a same meal at night, boom, you'll have a higher spike and a longer spike. And then you can try to do uh, activities to see if you can get your, your, your spike down. And so those, those are some cool tips to try. Now, we are, we've made it through. Now we're going into blood pressure monitoring. Okay, why should you have a blood pressure monitor? Well, one of the things is, is after COVID, you know, there used to be these blood pressure monitors in the grocery store and the, in the pharmacy, but they've taken all those away. I, I mean, just to try to be cleanly. And I, I haven't seen any of them out in the public anymore. I don't know, maybe where you are, it's different. But um, uh, if, if another big one is that people will go to the doctor and if they see the elevated blood pressure, a lot of times, they say, oh, it's white coat syndrome. Oh, it's white coat. Oh, you know, there was traffic and all this stuff. White coat syndrome is a thing. But if, you, if you've ever been told maybe this is white, blood, white coat syndrome, you should get your own blood pressure cuff. They're only $30 to $40. They're really accurate. You get a home, you get a, a, an arm blood pressure cuff. And you can find out for yourself whether you actually have white coat syndrome or if you have high blood pressure. Okay. So how do you do it? This is straight from the CDC. Okay. This is, this is not Dr. Harrington, but you know, I I'm pretty much telling people take your blood pressure whenever you want. So if you, so you find out, but there are ways to do it a little bit more, uh, uh, uh the same way every time and, and, and more perfectly. But, uh, if you don't take your blood pressure because you see all these steps and you get, uh, and you get a little bit intimidated, uh, then just take your blood pressure. But the idea is that you want to, um, you don't want to be uh, under stress. So go ahead and empty your bladder out. So you don't feel that kind of pain or pressure because pain drives up your blood pressure. Next, sit comfortably, sit for a few minutes. Five minutes is what they say. Make sure your feet are flat. Don't cross, don't have um, blood pooling because your blood, blood is being pooled in your legs and lowering your blood pressure falsely. So kind of sit, don't lean forward. Don't once again, crimp, crimp the, the venous blood from being circulated. So um, don't want to have less, less blood in your tank, uh, falsely lowering your blood pressure. Um, put, put your blood pressure cuff on, on the table and set your arm out. So it's kind of a uh, chest height. So level with the heart. What about left and right arm is left and right arm a thing. Well, they say, well, left arm is closer to the heart. Uh, but you should have about the same blood pressure on either arm and you can test it. And if one of them is higher than the other routinely, you should test the higher one. Basically, you, you should use the, the higher of the two to uh, uh, be your baseline. OK, do it against your bare skin, ideally. Here's another little tip. There's a little sort of target um, in, at the uh, along the cuff. This is where you're supposed to put it over the brachial artery, the kind of the middle of the arm, uh, because it's listening for the brachial artery blood flow uh, uh, when it squeezes. So that's, you kind of want to put, aim that towards the middle. Also, you'll see on, the, how do you know if the blood pressure cuff is big enough or too big or too small? Well, you'll see when you rotate it together and, and you cover it up, there is a little marking that says whether it's in the range or not. If it's past the range, um, you, you use a different cuff. So for example, uh, too small of a cuff will cause a high reading, too large a cuff will cause a low reading. Here is, when you, when you buy one online, you'll see that they'll have, you can measure your arm in the middle, in the middle of your upper arm, and you can determine how the circumference of it and choose whether you need a small adult, adult, large adult, et cetera. 
If you want to do a five-day blood pressure check, you're worried that you have white coat syndrome and you want to be prepared for your telemedicine visit, do blood pressure twice a day and, uh, and for about five days and get your baseline and talk to your doctor. Okay. You know, normally I don't try to treat blood pressure unless it's clearly elevated uh, and unless we clearly have patients who've determined they have elevated They've convinced themselves they have high blood pressure. I'm convinced they have high blood pressure because, uh, and they've tried lifestyle changes because I don't like to just throw people on medications, but um, we let patients basically go if they're hypertension stage one, if they're 140 or less, 90 or less diastolic, systolic, um, because we want people to get lifestyle changes a try and get, get it down. Um, if it's over 160, uh, and or if if the bottom number is really high, if you're having, ever having a hypertensive crisis, of course you want to treat right away. Um, but uh, these are sort of the levels that you can watch for. Okay, blood pressure protocol. Just like we talked about the uh, continuous glucose monitor, there are things you can try at the house to experiment and get your blood pressure lower. So um, uh, you can check your, your baseline. You can do different dietary changes. You can lower your salt. Uh, you can make sure that you're having no oil in your diet, um, no salt, oil, or sugar, you know, SOS. Um, you can see the difference if you're stressed or relaxed. You could try even doing some transcendental meditation and testing. Um, and you can test your blood pressure about 30 minutes to an hour after you exercise, and you'll notice a big difference as well. So, in the blood pressure protocol, we want to have the sodium and potassium balance skewed high on potassium. Uh, potassium helps your blood pressure go lower and sodium makes your blood pressure go high. So where sodium goes, water goes, and it's hard for the kidney to deal with all the sodium and excrete all the sodium uh, and you end up retaining fluid. So uh, here's a, the sodium, the potassium to sodium ratio greater than five to one is what you want. You want to get about 3,500 to 5,000 milligrams of potassium per day. And um, you, one little, another little uh, number trick you can use is having sodium less than one to one with your calories. So um, if you eat a 2,000 calorie diet and you had one, one to one, you'd have 2,000 milligrams of sodium, which is too high. We want to keep it low, less than 1,500. Another little trick is the idea of high nitrate greens. After age 50, your endogenous nit nitric oxide production, the thing your endothelium, the lining of your arteries does to dilate the arteries is down by 50%. And Dr. Esselstyn talks to us about this. And we know that you have to make sure that you're including exogenous stuff, uh, nitrates from the outside that will be converted into nitric oxide in the blood. And the big ones here are arugula, uh, various lettuces, Swiss chard, spinach, collards, and kale. That's kind of in a, uh, in a, in a descending, arugula is, is the king for, uh, for nitrates. Uh, rhubarb's in there as well, but I don't, I don't know too many people who just routinely eat rhubarb. Um, and beets, beets and, and, and is about similar to Swiss chard. So how do you know if you're getting these nitrates or not? Uh, well, you can use these test strips called a human N. There's other nitric oxide test strips and they test it in the saliva. And you'll see here this uh, magenta color um, about uh, two to three hours after eating a meal that contains like arugula, for instance, you can test and you'll see that the magenta color pop, pop positive. But at baseline, a lot of times you'll see that you're low and that's a, that's a little trick. That's a little trick to test. So I was talking about how the things you could try Look how the, the DASH diet, which was basically a vegan diet in disguise, um, high fruits and vegetables, low fat diet can drop blood pressure by 11 points. Aerobic exercise and resistance exercise, they both at, from five to, 10, five to eight points. Low sodium diet, less than 1500 can drop at six points. High potassium, four points is good. Lower alcohol, I don't recommend any alcohol. Uh, but try, men try to get at less than two drinks per day and women one drink. In this case, you can drop your uh, blood pressure by four points. And every kilogram that you lose, one kilogram or 2.2 pounds, you can drop your blood pressure by one point. Um, that's if you are overweight. 
uh, so it definitely uh, has a diminishing return after you get down to the lower but um, yep okay last the last test we're going to talk about is uh urinary testing urinary testing is um man you can buy these urine tests for cheap you can get for twenty dollars you can get a hundred of these strips 10 different tests sometimes 11 or more um and they cover a variety of conditions but if you have bladder spasms or bladder pain and you're constantly back and forth with the doctor about whether you have a uti or not it could be a real problematic uh, thing and take a lot of your time and and so but you just have the idea of having these tests at home you can kind of use that to your advantage bladder pain syndrome interstitial cystitis frequent utis other conditions like kidney stones or autoimmune kidney disease where people have like either blood or protein in their urine, uh, diabetes sometimes if they have kidney damage can have protein in the urine or severe high blood pressure, same thing, you can have kidney breakdown. So it's nice to have some of these tests in the house uh, and, and see how uh, if you're and monitor a little bit if you're having problems with the kidneys. So Wow, this is a confusing slide, right? But with the, this is an 11 parameter test. Uh, but the main things we're looking at here for UTI, for UTI monitoring is leukocyte esterase, nitrite, and blood. Okay. So, I mean, there's other tests, like we talked about protein and pH, uh, you know, glucose, this is for diabetics. So there's lots of other things you can use. And um, so it is multi-purpose. But for UTI, uh, leukocyte esterase is from uh, white blood cells, from neutrophils. It's, um, uh, a, a, and it, it, it demonstrates inflammation and, and uh, white blood, presence of white blood cells in the urine. Nitrite is a byproduct of bacteria. It doesn't come out from all bacteria and fungi and, and various things, but most very common uh, urine pathogens uh, like E. coli produce this. Sometimes on the, on the test, since it's a color-based test, see how it's pink. If you eat beets, you can have pink urine and it can kind of invalidate the test. Same thing with the urinary pain medication, azo. It, it can um, turn your urine kind of yellow, I mean, orange, and it can make it so it's hard to tell for this test. So this is called nitrite. Nitrate is higher if you get the first morning urine, if the urine is sit in the bladder for longer, you're more likely to be positive. Last one is blood. Uh, blood, you can see on these tests, um, it can be, it can, the bacteria is irritating the lining of the uh, bladder, you'll see blood. But also, if you have a history of kidney stones, you're having pain in the, in the flank, you can test to see if there's blood. Okay, I do have to admit, urinary tests are actually not perfect. They're not a perfect test because the sensitivity and specificity of these tests, kind of the accuracy is a little bit, it's not perfect. So um, if the if the Luke esterase and nitrate or nitrate are positive, sensitivity and specificity of 72 and 82%, if all three are positive, 82% uh, of being a true positive, if all three are negative, 67% of true negative. So this is a little disappointing. However, I wouldn't look at it like this. Uh, what if you're having a problem, you should get try to get these tests and get your baseline, and then you can see if there's something that's changed. And this will give you a little bit more information for your telehealth doctor to have. Uh, and so we can we can rely on these things based on your baseline. I think it increases the accuracy. So we're basically done, but I wanted to kind of go real quick on the idea of sensitivity and specificity. This is a, this is an idea of if you're trying to find a needle in a haystack, okay, stick your hand in the, in the haystack and it gets poked by the needle. Well, if you grab that needle, you're going to have hay in your hand. And this is the idea of a sensitive test, sensitive test, but there's several false positives, the hay being false positives. So but then from that group of things, you use a magnet, which is highly specific for the needle. And then you take that group and you use a specific test for the, uh, the ones that you pulled out from a sensitive test. And sometimes tests are like this, where you have um, a screening test and a, um, a confirmatory test. So um, that's one way to think about 
sensitivity and specificity, true positives versus true negatives. Okay. Take away, take charge of your health at home, use home health tools and work with a telemedicine provider who can be like your health coach and, uh, and uh, support your health journey. If you're vegan, get a doctor who gets you. I have uh, over 28 states, I have 28 states. And if you're in one of these states, I can be your doctor. I accept Aetna, Cigna, TRICARE and Medicare. Here is the map of where I am, and I would love to be your doctor. Thank you. Whoops, let me get my camera on. Thank you so much. All right. Wow, that's more than half of the United States right now. <laughs> yes, yeah. You know, we've lost a couple in the, you know, Midwest, uh, just I didn't have any patients from those from those states. So um, I have lost. So, but we still have 28 states and going strong. That's incredible. So, uh, you know, I always take questions that are sent in because, you know, it's just, that's a nice thing to do. I think uh, because they should know by now in the chat, they've got to do that. But there's a theme in the chat is how accurate is home tests and should home testing be done first thing in the morning in general? Um, home tests are pretty accurate. They're pretty accurate in the home. The home vital signs are pretty accurate. So various times, a, a lot of times the same test that you would do in the office, you know, the, um, uh, those, uh, home dipstick or the dipstick test for urine. A lot of times, same test they have at the doctor's office, same, same tests. Um, so many times they are good. Now it depends on what you want to know, uh, for the urine tests, the 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 first morning urine uh, is more likely to have more of that nitrate nitrite in it because it, it's been sitting longer and those bacteria have more time to produce some of that nitrite and so it'd be more likely to be positive there uh, than when it was more watered down throughout the day so yes there are certain times but you know they didn't mention which tests or which condition they were talking about but morning blood pressures versus night blood pressures. I recommend doing them twice a day, sort of a morning and an afternoon. Normally afternoon is kind of, uh, is, is I found for myself, I hire in the afternoon, you know, more, more stress throughout the day. What if somebody's a night worker? Does that impair some of these, te- not impair, but you know what I'm saying? Does it, are they different if somebody works at night, like glucose, things like that? Yes, yes. And there, I mean, it affects the circadian rhythms and how it affects the circadian rhythms would be how it would affect. Um, so that the the graph I showed of the glucose going high at night. Um, if your night, if your biological night is during the day, then then you would expect it to be be that way. But the problem with shift workers are always kind of shifting it back and forth. And I, you can't imagine the what was happening um, metabolically. So if you are a shift worker, I'd recommend trying to keep the same shift, trying to keep your um, your your rhythm the same every, every day so that you have more of a, uh, a peaceful circadian rhythm, so to speak. So even on days off, pretend like you're working. I, in other ideally, ways. ideally. I know that's not what most people probably do because everybody else is on a different time schedule and it's, that's you know, that's be one of so the things. Hard. Yeah. It'd be very we, rough. We didn't yeah. used to be a 24 hour society. <laughs> right. Right. Well, um, Mona says she has an appointment with you next month. And Connie wants to know if she saw you for telemedicine, then how do you get the labs done? Oh, well, um, basically, I create a lab order for you. Most of my lab orders are through Quest, but we also can I can do it through LabCorp. Um, And if you have a different lab, um, I would create an order and you take it and you they take it and they transcribe it. You know, like um, if you're at a local hospital lab, they just transcribe it. So I just send it to your email and you would print it off and take it with you someplace. And then that's how it works. How good and accurate is the Apple Watch for some of these home tests? They they have done, um, you know, I actually took part in a in a research study to help to validate the Apple Apple Watch. I don't take any kind of credit because there was that, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of physicians that were enrolled in the, in the study, but um, uh, it, it's, it's a screening test. It's a screening test to, uh, you know, it can see that your heart rate is ir- irregular and it, it alerts you. And then you can, I believe you can get it set up where it alerts your physician 
that you have um, an, an arrhythmia. And the, see, that's the problem. The problem with atrial fibrillation is that if the top of the heart is fibrillating, you're not getting good pumping action and you're getting some stasis of blood sitting there and pooling and it can coagulate and clot and you can throw a clot and have a stroke. So if you're having this uh, frequently, you need to be, you need to thin your blood basically. And uh, if you've had this and you have taken some medicine and everything is, and you, you're, you're basically, you're normal, it's nice to have a, um, a, an ability to scream if you if you flip into AFib because sometimes people don't know it. Mm. Do you take Medicare or yes. any any type of HMO Medicare or any type of HMO insurance? I I take Medicare. I take uh, but HMOs are are uh, it has to be it has to be uh, the HMO if if you're Aetna if you take Aetna I believe I can do Aetna HMO Cigna Cigna HMO but most of my patients are PPOs PPO okay there's another one there's like an EPO now and all kinds Ooh, of I don't even know what that is <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know either so anyway we've got questions all the way back from last month we didn't get to so I'm going to go to those first and the first one is from Leah and she wants to know what might be causing swollen fingers. They swell after meals when walking and sometimes are just swollen from sleep. She's 5'5", 130 pounds, mother of 258. She's been plant-based for decades, always low fat, other than some hidden fat at restaurants once or twice a month, despite careful ordering, intermittent fast until lunch, which is fruit, greens, dinner is starch and veg, minimal salt on surface of food. This um, cut out all nuts, but no difference. The only time the swelling was gone was for the tw her 27-day water fast. Last blood pressure was 110 over 70, and then she, everything was in normal range. I'm not a doctor, but can I say something? I, okay. I'm very salt sensitive. And I stopped, I, I, I pretty much was raised without salt because my parents were much older, like in their 50s and had heart disease. So I never got used to it. And then when I, I, it, it, I, I don't cook with salt. I've been really strict since 2008, but I'm lazy. So sometimes it'll sneak in through a condiment like ketchup, mustard, and salsa. And every time I have even the littlest of bit, my fingers are so swollen, I can't get my wedding ring off. So she's putting minimal salt on her food. And the fact that when she water fasted, it went away. Do you think that there could be a case made for her to do an experiment where she strictly just avoids salt for a period, even on the surface and in restaurants and see if it still happens? Wow, I feel like we're a good team, Chef AJ. <laughs> Go get him. Go get him, Chef AJ. No, but I, I really appreciate this question because salt is really problematic. And and um, I mean, Dr. Greger, he you know highlights that I think the World Health Organization reports that salt is like the number one killer of you know a, a food aspect of food in terms of dangerous, uh, reversible things that you can do with your food uh, is salt. And I mean, I, I mean, when you think about salt. Think about how it disrupts membranes. And I know this is kind of a creepy thought, but, uh, you know, you hear about, you know, people putting it on like worms and stuff and like the worms dying, you know, like it's, it's really disruptive to membranes, salt is. And, um, and so, yeah, if, if it sounds like you've done your, uh, your the, um, the caller has done their own experiment. They've proven that with the water fasting that uh, they, they don't have this phenomenon. And it's probably likely that the salt is just kind of creeped in, in in some way, various processed foods that you've added to the diet. Um, and so I, I really think you've answered your own question. Well, she says she still uses it, even though minimally on the surface of the food. And for somebody that's salt sensitive, minimal still might be too much. Right, right. A lot of times with these things, like with cholesterol and with salt, you know, sometimes it's not sort of a linear, uh, a linear, it's like sometimes the first little bit does the most damage, honestly. And it's kind of, so that's the, that's the reason to kind of go all the way. Great. Thank you. Um, so this is actually from last month too, but it kind of is on topic because you were talking about testing. So Trisha says, I recently had my blood drawn from Quest for a well visit and my total cholesterol was 118. Then a week later, I had to get a biometric screening for work, and they did a finger prick to check my total cholesterol, and it was 156. Both were fasting. Are finger pricks for checking total cholesterol as accurate as a blood draw? 
My total cholesterol has never been 156. It's always under 120. Just curious. And maybe you could just answer in general if finger sticks are accurate, because I was told by uh, several phlebotomists that they're not. And especially with this thing that people do now, it's like real trendy. Everybody's worried about deficiencies, even though most problems are caused by excesses, but everybody's getting their fatty acid profile checked. And you can do these little home tests. And I was told by a phlebotomist that they're not as accurate as a blood draw. So what do you think? Well, I would assume that they're not. And, and, and the reason is, is if they were as accurate, like it would put labs out of business in a way. I mean, they were trying to do this, this Theranos. I don't know if you've seen headlines about Theranos CEO. It was like one drop, you know, they had like this one drop and it was like, oh, we're going to be able to test everything from just one drop. And on, uh, obviously they haven't figured out that technology yet. Uh, a lot of times finger sticks and stuff are, are used for screening type testing. It, it can, because you, you're, you're weighing the idea of accuracy versus usability and um, applicability. And so you're willing to accept a certain amount of inaccuracy within a certain range. Uh, it's, it's kind of like the, you know, uh, iron testing right before you get blood or something like that. Uh, so I would assume I'm not looking at the numbers right now, but I would assume that they are willing to make these um, sacrifices of accuracy when they're doing this uh, in the in the field training or, or testing um, versus a lab, a lab type test. Great. Thank you. This is from Megan, and she said she developed epilepsy after sustaining several concussions playing sports. It's well controlled on Keppra and an implanted VNS device. MRI currently looks clear except for a small vestibular schwannoma. That's the thing about medical school. You got to like, well, there's a lot of schwannoma. <laughs> so okay. Almost sounds like shawarma. Can plant exclusive eating heal my brain and allow me to get off my medication? If so, how do I find a neurologist willing to let me try lowering my medication? I'm a first responder, but my doctors don't want to let me try getting off the meds, even though I have been seizure free for years now. Well, uh, you know, uh, a full disclosure, I'm not a neurologist and these, this is uh, this um, is something that you would, of course, you want to be in close, uh, um, working closely with your neurologist. But I will say that uh, a plant-based diet puts you at the best scenario for improving inflammation in the brain. Um, the the you know I did the I did the the fiber lecture you know the poop the poop lecture and and one of the things that came out when I was doing that was about the microbiome the short chain fatty acids and how they are anti-inflammatory to the brain and so. Um, you know, this is not my, this is not my area of expertise, epilepsy and these various devices, the VNS. And so I, I don't want to say, you know, that you'd be able to come off Keppra. Um, but one of the things that, that, that they'll do sometimes in epilepsy, if you've had a certain prolonged period of off, off, uh, without uh, a seizure, sometimes they'll give you an, an opportunity to come off of it. But if you've already failed multiple times having these uh, these uh, Kepra free windows and you failed and had seizures, then uh, then the preponderance of um, uh, the the prudence is to stay treated uh, with the medicine because you could have an, a, a you could be driving or you could be operating some machinery or you could have a, a, you could end up in in a scenario where you get hurt. Yeah, and. Maybe she should have a consult with a vegan neurologist, like one of the shares eyes, because they do telemedicine. I had a, I had a, a TBI right before the pandemic, and I couldn't see them, even though I lived near them, because they, you know, they weren't seeing people like at the beginning. And I did uh, just phone with her, and she's great. And I'm sure he's great too. So maybe she could ask a vegan neurologist. That's awesome. Yes, I saw uh, the shares eyes on the uh, holistic holiday at Sea Cruise. They were on there. They were awesome. They were awesome. Okay. So Marianne says, what are the best plant-based foods to eat for protein? And of course, I'd like you to answer that, but maybe you could also say that we don't have to worry about that because all food has, pro all plants have protein. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I love the, I love the protein freedom basically, because, you know, before I was on the plant-based diet and, you know, basically before I watched Forks Over Knives and became a vegan in 2012, I was, I, 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 there's like this scene in the Terminator 
where he's got like this little target. He's like, doo, 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 doo. and I joked around that um, when I would look at meals, I would have this little target going around and being like, doo, 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 where do I get my protein? And um, it, it was uh, it was on the brain all the time uh, with meals. Uh, and so, but the idea that you that the food that you eat contains protein and that you that the uh, expectation to get so much protein is overblown. And I recommend patients get 0.8 grams per kilogram of healthy body weight. And so healthy body weight, how do you calculate that? So the healthy body weight is um, 100. Uh, I think it's 100. For females, it's 100. And then you add five pounds for every inch above five feet. And uh, I think, and for, for men, oh man, I, I'm, I'm messing this up. I think it's 106 and you add five pounds for every, um, for every, um, inch over five feet, but then you have to divide it by 2.2 for pounds per kilogram and then multiply that by 0.8. And that'll give you your, um, your protein requirements, anywhere from 40 to 60 for most people. And that's totally doable with a plant-based diet. Absolutely. This is from Anonymous and it came in on May 8th, which was Monday. And the person says they scheduled an online appointment with you have not received any information. And the appointment is about in about 10 days. What is the process after an appointment is scheduled? Well, as your as your appointment gets closer, we enter you into our electronic medical record and you get a portal. Uh, you receive a portal um, uh, invitation. And you sign up and it, there's a HIPAA form and, uh, you know, medical release form. And uh, so you can go through that with it through the portal. Uh, but and then if anything that doesn't get done and before the for the appointment, we of course, we answer during the appointment. My appointments are an hour for the first visit. And so we have plenty of time to knock everything out. And so we'll we'll be getting to you very soon. Great. Thank you. <laughs> OK, you're going to have to help me pronounce this one. And uh, from Keisha, metatarsalgia. Meta, metatarsalgia, yeah. Yeah, wants to know if it will eventually go away on its own. What can I do naturally to help? And when should I see a specialist? I eat whole food, plant-based, SOS-free. So uh, for pain in the, the forefoot, um, pain in, in the mid to forefoot, uh, it depends on the cause of the pain. It depends on if you are um, aggravating it kind of almost like a wear and tear kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it depends on what is aggravating it. A lot of times with these kind of things, you're trying to alter your activities in a way that can help decrease your pain. Uh, so there are nerve syndromes, Morton's neuroma, where uh, the metatarsals are um, pushing on the nerve and uh, so the bones of the foot are pushing on the nerve and causing lightning-like symptoms or nerve symptoms, numbness and tingling. But if it's an ache, if it's like an arthritis type of wear and tear type of pain, then the goal is to alter your activities, non-impact activities. Um, this is a musculoskeletal uh, problem. And so it's the cure uh, is, is, is rest from that, uh, something that's injuring it, as far as I understand. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Chef, Chef AJ, I wanted to get back to you about the, uh, I was trying to do this off the top of my head. The, um, the protein, uh, it's 106 pounds plus six pounds for every inch taller for men for this, uh, healthy body weight calculator. This is a lean body weight and hundred pounds plus five pounds for every inch taller, uh, for, uh, for women. And then you divide by 2.2. So uh, yeah, I just want to make sure I get that right. Thank you. This is from Anonymous. I have had my gallbladder removed. I'm whole food plant-based. How can I tell the difference between a feeling of just gas rolling through versus needing to actually go to the bathroom right away? I'd say go to the bathroom here on the side of caution. If nothing comes out. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> right. Well, um, you know, this is a big deal because people get uh, their gallbladders removed and then... Um, I, I may have said before this analogy of the Dawn dishwasher liquid, uh, you know, the bile's job uh, is to help emulsify fats so you can absorb them. Well, uh, if anybody's ever tried to use Dawn dishwasher liquid, this nice, thick, viscous liquid on a greasy pot, we don't have greasy pots because we're not using oil, right? But uh, in the past, 
This nice concentrated Dawn dishwasher liquid is the analogy for the concentrated bile. The gallbladder concentrates it and it gets nice and sudsy and you can wash it away. Well, with a gallbladder removed, the, the bile, the analogy is that the Dawn dishwasher liquid is not, uh, Dawn dish soap is thinned, thinned out and watered down. And when you try to put it on fat, it doesn't emulsify it as readily as uh, a concentrated version. And so when you have your gallbladder removed, you cannot tolerate big boluses of fat and you will develop this rah, 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 uh, uh, almost like a dumping syndrome, a whooshing. Uh, and, and you'll, um, some people get, they sort of get tolerant to it and they start eventually eating like they did prior to their gallbladder removal. But at first, a lot of times people will experience this um, uh, incomplete malabsorption. They'll have sort of gas pain and, um, and kind of, you know, have to go to the bathroom, have to have bowel movement. And so, yeah, if you're, if you're feeling an urge, you know, uh, go ahead and try, go to, the, go to the bathroom, but then be real careful with the, the fat intake. It just gives you an extra feedback mechanism to be like, oh man, I'm going to really defat, defat my diet. Yeah. Great. I just, I should have said this at the beginning. I love your haircut, by the way. It's spectacular. <laughs> Makes you look even more like Tom Cruise. Oh and man. Oh great. man. Okay. All right. High so, speed. <laughs> this is from Sheba. I understand that insulin resistance can occur even long before glucose levels become high. If that is the case, then why aren't fasting insulin and glucose usually measured together? And do whole food plant-based eaters need to consider anything if they measure this? And she thanks you for your excellent presentations on previous shows. Okay, okay, okay. I, Chef Age, you got to have to help, help me with this one because my mind started to drift uh, because I realized this has to be the last question because I have a patient here. Yeah. I have a patient at the top of the hour. Yeah, so, sure, sure, sure. Or yeah, we yeah. Can bring it back next next month yeah. too. So yeah. Uh, uh, why I, aren't uh, glucose? Why aren't fasting insulin and glucose measured together? Well, well, for the most part, if if you're not um, diabetic, you don't, we're not really worried too much about your insulin level. There is something called HOMA IR to try to look up insulin resistance. And if you are, um, uh, additional testing causes additional costs and sort of along, along with the, the, in the long run, you know, you want to lower your cost and be sort of, uh, uh, efficient with your testing. Uh, so clearly, uh, having insulin, uh, fasting insulin uh, related to the fasting glucose allows for an insulin resistance test called HOMA IR. And this is becoming more and more popular and, um, uh, and something that you can follow over time. So if you have good insurance or you have the ability to cover this, this is something you talk to your doctor and you can, you can do it, but it hasn't made it into mainstream testing for every time because of an additional cost probably. Great. Well, you can go. I'll say goodbye to them. You don't need to stay on. Thank you, Dr. Harrington. Look All forward right. To next I month. am going to go sign off and see my patients, but I, I love being here. And thank you so much, Chef AJ. Oh, we, love, we love having you and we love your questions. So guys, to get a, your priority, please subscribe at chefaj.com and you'll get to the top of the list. We send out a the lineup every weekend to you. You just simply respond. And please come back at 2 p.m. for a bonus show with Chris Kendall. He's going to be making vegan, raw, Ethiopian Watts stew.